Hi, good afternoon. Oh, yeah. Welcome to the CIPAM seminar. And my name is Masayoshi Tomizuka. I'm from Department of Mechanical Engineering. And my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Chang Liu Liu. She's from Stanford, but she graduated Berkeley. She came to Berkeley in 2012 after graduating from Tsinghua. And we recruited her, giving her Berkeley Fellowship. And she got at least three degrees from Berkeley, the Master of Science, Master of Art in Mathematics, and of course, PhD. And this is a topic she worked for her PhD and giving talk today. Currently, she works in the Center for Automotive Research at Stanford. And in January next year, she will be joining uh, from C CMU, right? Yeah, almost forgot name. <laughs> okay, so go ahead. Thank you, Professor, for the introduction. Hey, it's really my great honor to come back to Berkeley and give you this talk, sharing with you of my research on robotics control and human-robot interactions. So human-robot interactions have actually been recognized as a key element for future robots in many application domains. For example, in manufacturing, in transportation, in service, and entertainment. And those applications will have um, huge social and economical impacts. And my primary focus is on manufacturing and the transportation. So although today's factory has actually reached high level of automation, some of the delicate assembly tasks are still performed extensively and sometimes expensively by hand. For example, in the final assembly lines for automobile industry and in the assembly lines for electronic devices. And bringing collaborative robots into those environments are beneficial in order to assist human workers and to free the human workers from those tedious and straining tasks. It is anticipated that the factory of the future will have a lot of human-robot collaborations. And this is especially in the flexible assembly lines as shown in the figure there. It is ideal for factories to employ those human-robot teams in order to leverage each other's skill and strengths. For example, humans' intelligence and dexterity and the robots' precision productivity. And this is also very good to create a cost-effective and resource-efficient uh, manufacturing world. But of course, in order to make such scenario come true, safety is a huge concern. We do not want the robot to hurt human. We also do not want the robot to be too conservative. The conventional safety measure is to slow down the robot motion or even stop the robot motion if a human come close. But collaborative robots actually need to interact very closely with humans. So their motion should not only be safe to humans, but also very efficient in finishing the tasks. And this requires high level of intelligence. And my primary work objective is to uh, design, uh, introduce new approaches in designing the robot behavior so that they can interact safely and efficiently with humans, as demonstrated by our uh, experiment video here. And I will talk about the uh, technical details later. So on the other hand, um, the impacts of the autonomous vehicles have been widely discussed. And one major argument is that they will increase the safety level of the transportation system by avoiding a lot of human errors. For example, drunk driving, tired driving, and distracted driving. But are we there yet? So actually, in a lot of cases, the autonomous vehicles are too conservative. And many of you may have already seen this video before. So this autonomous vehicle even tries to yield this another vehicle, which it has, does not have any conflict with, due to the uncertainties in the perception and decision making. How do human drivers do? Um, so this video, this is a video I took at a middle-sized intersection at Shanghai. There's no left and light, so the uh, vehicles should, so the drivers of those vehicles should be very cautious. But the drivers of the vehicles from different directions managed to cross each other one by one, maximizing the traffic efficient, efficiency, leaving very small gaps between one another. So it is safe to conclude that there's still a long way to go for autonomous vehicles to have comparable performance with experienced human drivers. But this is still possible as demonstrated by our research and shown in the animation here, um, which I'll also discuss about this detail in later. In summary, the design objective for 
um, the code robots is to make sure that their motion is both efficient and safe. But the interactions, actually in a well-defined and deterministic environment, some of this requirement can be fulfilled by the state of art. But the interactions with other intelligent entities bring a lot of uncertainties to the system. And there are also computation limits that we cannot always uh, reason for all the possible scenarios fast enough online. And these are the major challenges faced by those co robots. And my primary research goal is to design the behavior of those robots in dynamic uncertainty environment under those limited computation capacity in order to maximize the efficiency of the robot motion and guarantee safety. Before we go into technical details, let's take a deeper look at the, uh, of the system that we are working with. So the human robot system can actually be viewed as a multi-agent system where all the intelligent entities can be regarded as an agent. Uh, in this figure, we take the perspective of an uh, industrial robot, which is surrounded by several humans. And every agent has its own dynamics. The robot has sensors to sense the state of all the agents in the environment and make decisions through this behavior system. Meanwhile, all the human agents also have their five senses to sense each other and make decisions accordingly. So in this system, all the agents are deeply coupled together, making it very hard to design the behavior system for the robot. And when we say a behavior system, it is actually a mapping from the data obtained through the sensors to the action that will be applied to the physical plant. It is usually determined through a logic or policy or law, which optimize an internal cost function given the model of the world. And we call the internal cost in the model as the knowledge module. Um, and also, in order to account for unforeseen scenarios um, during online execution, there are learning modules to update the logic and the knowledge uh, for the robot to be more adaptable. Borrowed from economics, we call the left-hand left side behavior system the microscopic system, and the right-hand side multi-agent system the macroscopic system, which can describe general human-robot collaboration and the general transportation system. And my research focus is on the microscopic behavior design for single agent, as well as the evaluation of such design in a macroscopic multi-agent perspective. And the methods have actually been applied to various applications in uh, transportation and manufacturing. The mathematical problems formulated in the methodology layer is primarily solved using optimal control, optimization, and some game theory. And in this talk, um, I will cover mostly on the microscopic behavior design side, as well as um, the optimization algorithms that we developed to enable such design. To start with, let's look at um, the behavior design problem. So for behavior design, we actually deal with the microscopic system. That is, how can we specify the logic, the knowledge, and the learning for a robot? Actually, there are lot of methods to design an agent behavior. For example, classic control method, adaptive control, learning from demonstration, uh, reinforcement learning, and imitation learning. But as the systems that we are dealing with are all safety critical, in order to make the robot adaptable to the change of the environment, as well as to allow the designers to have more control over their behavior in order to provide safety guarantees, we work uh, in a, we work uh, on a method in the framework of adaptive optimal control or adaptive uh, model predictive control, uh, where we will explicitly design the cost and the policy and the learning module for the robot while leaving the uh, identification of the model to the learning module so that the robot can learn the environment through the real-time interactions. And the internal cost of the robot is designed as this form, which is a constraint optimal control. The robot will try to optimize a cost function for task performance and motion efficiency, where this cost depends on the robot state, robot input, and the robot goal, where the robot, while the robot goal may depend on the human state. There are certain constraints for the problem, of course. The first uh, kind of constraint is dynamic feasibility constraint. For example, uh, control saturation and state, state space limit, as well as the uh, system dynamics. The last constraint is the most important constraint, which is the safety constraint during interactions, 
where xh uh, here represents the human state and rs is the safe set respect to the human state. Usually this constraint is designed as a collection of states such that the minimum distance between a human and the robot is greater than some threshold. And to simplify the geometry, we introduce capsule representations to wrap all the human body and the robot body. And the radius of the capsule is a design parameter such that vulnerable parts of human body will have larger radius. But actually, this constraint is very hard to deal with because we do not know the human model, so we cannot have very precise prediction of human motion in the future. And even the human state is not measured perfectly due to sensor noises. So if we are going to solve this optimal control problem in a long time horizon, the accumulation of all the uncertainties will make the robot behavior very conservative. And to better illustrate this challenge, let's consider this simplified problem where we have a closed environment and the robot tries to go to the target, avoiding the human. For better illustration, we introduce the time axis. So at the first time step, the robot will have some prediction of human trajectory with some uncertainty. This kind of prediction may, may depend on the robot's uh, trajectory, but for simplicity here, we just use a fixed prediction. And given the prediction, the robot will plan a trajectory of its own, avoiding this uncertainty corn. And as time propagates, the traject robot trajectory will be executed and the human trajectory will be observed. And in the next time step, this process repeats, predict human trajectory and compute robot trajectory and then execute. And this process can be repeated again and again. And this is the conventional model predict control method, which is safe, however, too conservative. As the robot is almost terrified by the uncertainty perceived of the human motion. So what is happening here? Let's go back to the previously discussed objective, design objectives and the constraints. So if we try to emphasize optimality, then our planning should look for our uh, or we should plan in a long time horizon. Otherwise, the system may be easily trapped into local optima, as shown here, especially if the obstacle has some concave structure. But under computation limits, long time horizon means long computation time, which implies larger uncertainty accumulation. If you want the system to be safe, then the motion will be very conservative, and this will directly contradict with the optimality goal. But how can we solve this paradox? One way is to relieve some of the constraints. For example, introduce faster computation or have better human models to reduce the uncertainty level. But my insight is that we can also do something in the objective layer. How about we separate the objectives? Instead of using one single planning scene to address both objectives, why not using two different planners addressing these two different objectives? By doing so, we can have a long-term planning module with only rough estimation of the human behavior to address the efficiency goal. And then have a short-term reactive planning module considering all the uncertainties to address the safety goal. And uh, I call the long-term planner the efficiency controller and the short-term planner the safety controller. These two planners can run in parallel and they can be combined in a manner of hierarchical control. And we are also going to illustrate the performance in the previous example. In the first time step in the efficiency controller, the human trajectory will be predicted again, but this time the robot trajectory will be planned uh, without considering the uncertainty in the prediction. Then this long-term trajectory will be sent to the safety controller for monitoring. In the first step in the safety controller, the uncertainty of human motion will be predicted and it will be checked whether the long-term trajectory is safe to be executed or not. In this case, it is safe, so it is executed. But in the next time step, it is no longer safe as the trajectory intersects with the predicted uncertainty corn. Then the safety controller generates a detour, avoiding this uncertainty corn. Meanwhile, the long-term planning module, the efficiency controller, is working on a new long-term plan, given a new estimation. And once computed, this new long-term plan will be sent to the safety controller for monitoring, overriding the previous plan. And as this new plan is safe, it successfully guides the robot towards its target. So this method is actually non-conservative. And because it has a 
uh, long-term planning module in the efficiency controller, it avoids the local optimal problem that most short-term planner may have. And most importantly, the uncertainty is still addressed in this case. Of course, these two planners run in different frequency. And here we are going to execute the uh, computation time flow. Um, in the first, at the first step, there's a, 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 the long-term trajectory will be sent from the efficiency controller to the safety controller. And then the safety controller will try to monitor the trajectory. The upper layer is showing the planning horizon, and the bottom layer is showing the computation time. So the uh, planning horizon may not necessarily be just one step, but it is relatively short. While the safety controller is doing computation, the efficiency controller is working on a, a long-term plan with relatively lar uh, longer planning horizon and, of course, relatively longer computation time. And once the plan is computed, it is sent to the safety controller, and then safety controller begins another monitoring. And meanwhile, the efficiency controller will work on a new long-term plan, and this process will be repeated again and again. And this approach can actually be regarded as a two-layer MPC, which leverages the benefits of um, both long-term planning and short-term planning. And just to provide some idea, the efficiency controller typically runs at 1 hertz, while the safety controller typically runs at 100 to 1,000 hertz. Um, but of course, the stability uh, issue of this parallel planner is critical. Although it is demonstrated uh, stable through simulation and experiment, currently we are working on theoretical proofs of the stability. Right. And another issue that is very uh, uh, important is that um, given the planning architecture, whether the algorithm is fast enough to compute a feasible, feasible and a safe trajectory within the desired sampling rate. So in order to address this problem, we develop different um, optimization algorithms to solve the nonlinear and non-convex problem resulted from the motion planning problem. For the safety control, uh, for the safety controller, we developed the um, algorithm called the safe set algorithm, uh, which adopts the idea of invariant set to transform the non-convex state space constraint to a convex control space constraint. And uh, through some reachability analysis, we can prove that the trajectory will no longer go outside the safe set. And for the long-term planning in the efficiency controller, we developed the idea, the algorithm, so-called convex filo set algorithm, that directly transformed the non-convex problem into a sequence of convex subproblems. And uh, we will discuss this algorithm in detail later. All right, so that's the parallel structure. And actually, the logic for the robot is much more complicated than just having the two planners. Um, here, we have this. Uh, three-layer C sync and dupe structure, where the robot will have some perception module to estimate the system state and predict the future trajectory of the systems using some uh, online learned model, and then using the prediction to do um, motion planning in both controllers. This efficiency controller and the safety controller optimize the same cost function, but with different planning horizon and different resampling frequency. Then the trajectory will be combined and sent to a low-level regulation module to generate desired control input to the physical plant. So this, is, this concludes the microscopic design. We have actually uh, evaluated such design in various human robot platforms. And first, I'm going to show some results for an uh, industrial robot. And in order to protect the human users in the early phase of deployment, uh, we developed various evaluation platforms. Uh, from virtual reality-based simulation to dummy robot interaction, and finally go to human robot interaction. Uh, for virtual reality-based simulation, we actually let the human subject to interact with a virtual robot. And the, the human can observe the motion of the virtual robot through a virtual reality display, and the human reaction will be captured through cameras. Yeah, and in this, uh, this video, the robot is required to um, follow this red trajectory from one endpoint to another endpoint. And this is my colleague, Tang uh, Te here. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we can see if the human gets close, the motion of the robot is very compliant. But when human goes away, the robot tries to finish its task. So then we bring the hardware in the loop and introduce this dummy robot interaction platform. 
uh, where the robot will interact with a dummy controlled by a human subject at some distance. And the human can observe the interaction between the dummy and the robot from a distance. Um, in this case, uh, we ask the robot to move the black work piece from left to right and right to left, back and forth, while the dummy is wandering around in, in the robot workspace. And the robot arm is covered as requested by our sponsor, but later I'll show some video without covering the robot arm. Why did they, huh? why did they request to cover the robot arm? <laughs> 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 it seems like a good advertisement. <laughs> Maybe this will be a better advertisement, making people curious what robot is this. <laughs> Yeah, okay, and uh, so this kind of disturbance brought by the dummy is actually an extreme case, which may not be encountered very often in real production lines. But as shown in the video here, um, the robot under the, our design can still perform the task efficiently and safely under these extreme cases. And all the trajectories are computed online without any prior known motion primitives. All right, for the third platform, the system becomes more dynamic where the robot arm is request, required to move the black work piece uh, into this moving target box while avoiding the dynamic obstacle. And this case can be viewed as an abstraction of a human-robot collaborative assembly, where the human will accept a tool from the robot. So the human hand that accepts the tool can be regarded as the target box, and the, the other human hand can be regarded as the obstacle. So in this video, the left-hand side is showing the perceived environment uh, from the Kinect. And the yellow trajectory is the planned long-term trajectory. Sometimes this long-term trajectory is followed, but sometimes not. In a case it is not followed, that is because the uh, safety controller modifies the trajectory for real-time safety. And it is worth pointing out that uh, unlike other um, collaborative robots such as UR5 uh, and Baxter, and this kind of robot was previously adopted in those heavy, repetitive, and deterministic production lines. And it is the first time that we uh, bring them into this highly stochastic and interactive tasks. But everything worked on very well. Um, the robot is very responsive and safe. This is due to the adoption of the parallel planning structure as well as the fast online optimization algorithms to generate the um, trajectories in real time. The video is sped up again? Is what? Is the video sped up? Yes, uh, two times, 2x. Okay, so is that because of the computation time or is that limited by the robot? Um, because when we are doing this experiment, we do not want the robot motion to be too fast because it, there are some safety issues, so we slow down the robot motion. And then we went one step further to real human robot collaborations. And this is my colleague, Xian Zhong. <laughs> and I, I was uh, standing um, behind the scene holding the emergency brake button in case any <laughs> unexpected thing happened. <laughs> OK. And, but as we can see from this video, um, it almost redefines the image of those um, conventionally cold and bulky industrial robots. Now they are very human friendly, they are responsive, but they are also very productive in finishing the tasks. All right, so that's, oh, and also we demonstrated this uh, work in Cal Day last April. Uh, and it attracts actually a lot of people from various backgrounds, and especially the kids. They are so excited to find that they can move the target box all around the table and the robot should, can still know where it is and correctly place the workpiece into the target box. All right, so that's all the our, our application on industrial robot. All right, so actually the same design can be applied to autonomous vehicle um, just by changing some of the parameters in the knowledge module for the vehicle. And in this project, we're collaborating with Stencil. Well, we want to be fast, we want to be safe. So it's not about being the first or fastest, it's about being the safest. The system adopts a unique parallel trajectory planning architecture, which includes an efficiency-oriented long-term planner and a safety-oriented short-term planner. This architecture leverages the strength of the two planners so that the vehicle is equipped with a global perspective and is able at the same time to respond in a timely manner to emergencies. And the emergency situation may be the case that 
the front vehicle just go to a sudden stop. Uh, in this case, the white vehicle is the autonomous vehicle, and the other vehicle is controlled by a human subject. And another case of emergency is that the rear vehicle just go crazy. OK, and the, with the design, we can also allow the autonomous vehicle to track a relatively large speed in a slow moving traffic, as shown here. And the strategy the autonomous vehicle is taking is just by doing a lot of lane change, but very safely. All right, so that's the applications. And actually, as we mentioned earlier, the, um, optimal, the optimization problem for the motion planning problem is actually not very easy to solve because the problem is highly nonlinear and non-convex. And we actually designed novel optimization solvers to speed up the computation. So the problem is, uh, is formulated in an optimal control form in a continuous time. And in order to take the advantage of numerical methods, we actually discretize the trajectory and then transform the problem into a general non-convex optimization. And usually this kind of uh, non-convex optimization is solved using a method uh, like sequential quadratic pro programming, which iteratively solve a quadratic subproblem, where the quadratic subproblem is obtained through quadratic approximation of the Lagrangian of the original problem, and also the linearization of all the constraints. But SQP is actually very hard to be real time. This is because it's a generic algorithm, and it neglects the unique geometric feature of the problem that we are facing. And what are the geometric features? There are actually two very important features of the problem. One is symmetry in the control input. So usually, the cost function of our problem is designed to be convex, and it will penalize the um, magnitude of the control input. And also, the constraint for the control input usually have um, symmetric lower and upper bound. And the second feature is the affine dynamics. That is, the control input does not enter the nonlinearity part of this uh, equality constraint. With this understanding, we can show the geometrical features of the problem in the simplified 3D space, where the uh, horizontal plane represents the space spanned by the uh, state trajectory, and the vertical axis is the space spanned by the uh, control trajectory. The nonlinear manifold G here, actually, uh, the nonlinear equation G here defines a nonlinear manifold in this uh, simplified 3D space. And there are several holes taken from the manifold due to the space, state space constraint gamma. So actually, the gray part are just complement of gamma. And the contours of the cost function is shown both on the manifold and also on the projected um, 2D space here. Although the cost function is convex by itself, and also the projection on the 2D space is convex, the cost contour on the manifold is non-convex because the manifold itself is nonlinear. So to search for a solution in this nonlinear manifold is very hard. But as we have these two features, symmetry and affineness, what if we solve search for solutions in the volume above this manifold? So unlike the manifold, there's a linear structure in the new uh, search space for solutions. And the best thing is that because um, we penalize the magnitude of control input, so if we move in the negative direction of the uh, axis u, the cost will go down, assuming the horizontal plane is where u equal to 0. So that means if we run the optimization, the, uh, the mechanism, such as gradient descent, the mechanism will automatically pull the solution down to the bottom of this volume that is, uh, that automatically satisfy the nonlinear quality constraint. And to even speed up computation, we can find some convex feasible set inside this non-convex domain. But of course, in order to compensate the error during this uh, relaxation and the convex fixation, some iterations are needed. And here, we're going to illustrate the iteration process. Uh, and we further simplify the problem into this uh, relaxed form, where we optimize o just over the uh, variable x. And the cost j is convex. Uh, constraint gamma is non-convex. So given the initial reference, we can find a convex fuel set inside the non-convex domain and optimize the problem in the convex feasible set instead of the non-convex domain, and check whether it converge or not. If not, we go back. If converge, we'll output a solution. And this process will be illustrated in these two animations here, where the gray part are the infeasible area, the complement of gamma, and the contours are shown as the colored curve here. So the optimal solution lies here. In the first case, 
uh, we have a reference which is feasible. So we can compute a convex field set as this red polygon containing the reference. And then with the iteration, we can find a better solution in the convex field set and use this solution as the new reference. And this iteration will finally lead us to the optima here. Even if we have a initially infeasible reference as shown in the second case, we can still con compute a convex field set. Um, but uh, the reference is not included in the set. And the iteration goes very similarly to the previous case, and it will finally lead us to the optima. And it wor worth noting that this space is a trajectory space. So in the Cartesian space, this uh, iteration goes like, first we have a reference as shown as this dashed line, and then the um, trajectory is perturbed first to this light pink trajectory, and then finally it will converge to this dark um, black optimal trajectory in a few iterations. And we have actually proved mathematically that the sequence generated by this iteration will converge absolutely and at least to a local optima of the problem. So the application of this convex fuel set algorithm to motion planning problems actually have uh, some similarity with other works. For example, the idea of using uh, perturbed trajectory in a convex corridor or convex tube, where uh, in, in the different uh, researchers. Where in those research, um, the authors try to find a bubble for each point along the trajectory and then perturb the whole trajectory inside the uh, corridor or tube um, formulated by those bubbles. And if we plot the convex field set in a time augmented space, the convex field set showing the red, uh, showing the blue chunk there, also looks like a convex corridor. But the difference of our method uh, is that we can tolerate infeasible reference, and also the convex corridor in our case is maximum, and we have theoretical guarantees of convergence of the solution. While in other methods, um, this kind of um, technology techniques are used more like heuristics. Finally. Uh, our CFS algorithm is actually a generalized non-convex optimization solver which can handle other optimization problems that have similar geometric features in addition to trajectory optimization. And we compare the method with the SQP, uh, compare our method with uh, SQP in, a, in this simplified uh, experiment where we ask the robot to go to the five corner points a four corner points uh, in sequence. And then we optimize the path. So initially, paths one, two, and five is collision free. So um, there's no big difference between the two algorithms. But paths three and four uh, is not collision free. And SQP takes way longer time and way more iterations to get a feasible solution. Yeah. But some people may argue that SQP is known to be very slow. What is, uh, how does your method um, compare with other more efficient non-convex optimization solvers? So we also did comparison uh, with the interior point method, which is known as the fastest uh, non-convex optimization solver. So in this figure, the horizontal plane, a horizontal axis represents the number of sampling points on the path, which shows the dimension of the problem. And the vertical axis is showing the total computation time in milliseconds. So as we can see, it, when the scale of the problem is not very large, uh, interior point method has very comparable performance with our method. But it does not scale very well, and it blows up very quickly. But for our method, uh, it only, the computation time only goes up linearly when the dimension goes up. So where do you use the fact that you have symmetric input constraints? Symmetric? Oh, that, that is in the relaxation step. Yeah. Um, so to give a better illustration of the advantage of a method, our method, we show uh, here we're showing the trajectories during the iterations in the two algorithms. As we can see, in our method, CFS algorithm, um, the trajectory converge very fast, and the trajectories during each iteration is already smooth enough. Um, but in the t interior point method, it first takes a lot of uh, iterations to make the trajectory feasible, and then also take a lot of iterations to smooth the trajectory. 
So in conclusion, um, the advantage we are gaining here is because we explicitly exploiting the geometric features of the problem by relaxation and convexation. So one consequence is that we can have unconstrained step size. So the uh, number of iterations is reduced. And then we do not need to do line search anymore. So the, num uh, the computation time during each iteration is also reduced. And finally, as we directly search in a feasible area, so we can get good enough solution even before convergence, where good enough means feasible and safe. So we can safely stop the iteration and uh, execute the suboptimal trajectory. And we believe this method, uh, real-time computation, will facilitate future human, um, uh, future passenger vehicle interactions, as shown here. So we allow the passenger to specify a parking space on the phone. And just by one click, the vehicle can compute a desired trajectory towards the parking space and then drive the vehicle towards the parking space. And this is very smooth because we have very fast algorithm to compute the trajectory. And we believe this will have great potential to uh, future automatic valet parking. All right, so that's all for the microscopic behavior design. And I will just spend a couple of minutes to talk about the microscopic part. Um, because an important question to ask is whether, given the microscopic design, whether the agent can perform well in a multi-agent system. And to motivate this kind of analysis, let's consider this unmanaged four-way intersection. Well, all the vehicles arrive at the same time at a stop sign. So it is undetermined who should go first. But the vehicles may try to inch forward and test the response of others. But if all the vehicles inch forward in a synchronized manner, then the system may be trapped in an inch stop and then inch stop loop, which will finally go to a, a deadlock. So what is happening here? If you are familiar with game theory, this is a typical chicken game. There are multiple Nash, uh, Nash equilibria in the system or multiple ways of passing the intersection. And the vehicles do not know which Nash equilibrium to commit into. And this cannot be solved merely through microscopic behavior design if the agents do not have consensus among each other. And also, it is very um, overwhelming for the agent to solve a combinatorial optimization for all the vehicles. So what we do is, in addition to the designed um, behavior as we discussed before, we can add a conflict resolution module. Uh, and in, inside this module, we can ask the, uh, the agent to solve a conflict graph locally. And then the local solutions can form a global solution of the um, combinatorial optimization of the intersection. And this is illustrating the performance of this method. Uh, with this method, we can see the vehicle no longer need to have a full stop at the intersection, but they can just um, go with full speed. All the vehicles entering the intersection mm -hmm. are automated with this conflict graph. Yes, right. So it isn't that there is other... Yeah, homogeneous. Yeah, so in this case, are all the vehicles are homogeneous. Yeah, and actually this method can scale up to multiple lanes. And uh, this fully distributed method, we have proved that it is dynamically feasible considering all the constraints of the vehicle dynamics. And also, we have guaranteed the stability of this um, strategy. What information is communicated between the vehicles? Um, it is the, um, the, path, the future path, so the intention, and the time the vehicle will occupy the conflict zone. Yeah. Uh, yeah as Professor just mentioned, there are a lot of open problems. What if the vehicles are not homogeneous? What if some of the vehicles are using different strategies? And what if there are some malicious behaviors? And how can we scale up this kind of method to multiple intersections and even to the road network? Uh, and these are open problems and, uh, that I'm working with my collaborators currently. All right, so that concludes my work. And uh, in the future, I would like to um, establish my research in all these three layers. In the application layer, I would like to dig into the um, realistic applications in transportation and manufacturing. For example, autonomous vehicle, 
uh, connected vehicle, smart transportation, and the human-robot interactions in production lines. And the goal is to have human-compatible co-robots. For the methodology, I would like to um, extend the current design to more um, to diverse systems and also explore new designs for different for new problems. And the goal is to try to generalize the methodology in robot behavior design so that we can figure out the general structure that can cover a wide range of application and also figure out the domain specific parameters for special applications. For the tool part, I would like to continue my research on real-time computation of the optimization problems and also try to uh, understand systems with interacting components in more uh, in different levels of details. Actually, human robot systems have a very broad spectrum ranging from systems that human has the authority to make the final decisions to the system that the robot has the authority to make final decisions. And what has been covered in this talk uh, it's just a very small portion here where the human and the robot has the equal right to make decisions and they mainly try to solve the conflict avoidance problem as we discussed earlier. And I I'm very uh, interested in exploring other kind of human robot systems. For example, the interactions between um, teleoperators and teleoperated robots and also between uh, human teachers and uh, robot learners, between passenger uh, between drivers and uh, driving assistive systems, between humans and uh, active human assisted devices, between robot nurse and human patient, and also between passengers and fully autonomous vehicles. And it also worth noting that uh, there are also interactions between our human designers and the robot that we design. So how can we design the robot so that they can do good things for us? and uh, not out of control, and how can we better understand ourselves um, when we are being, when we are, uh, being the uh, creator of other intelligent entities? Those are important questions to answer, and uh, uh, I think opportunities and uh, challenges coexist, and I would like to continue my research along this line in order to create a harmonic human-robot society in the future. So lastly, I would like to acknowledge all the sponsors that supported the work presented here, and uh, my PhD advisor, Professor Tomizuka, and all my collaborators. And so not all the, all the people are in this figure, but I just thought this figure is a very nice figure. We took it last summer <laughs> when, when I graduated. Yeah. So that's all. Thank you so much.